Number five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. This has sort of been a through yep. line to at least the beginning part of our conversation. Yeah, well, the first thing is it's the monster thing, like the Beauty and Beast thing. You are not a good guy, and you will take revenge on your children if they misbehave. You think, oh no, well, I, I like my children. It's like other people might not like them. Maybe they don't behave very well, you know, and you think you like them because you're a saint, but you're not. And you will take revenge on those children if they do things that make you dislike them. So you're in the grocery store and you've got a four year old, and the four year old's pretty smart, and checking you out all the time, you're like pro poking <laughs> you and prodding you and seeing what's there, because that's what little kids do. They're not that verbal. So they're, they're, they're like, they, they, they have. You could compare their behavior in some ways to pack animals like dogs, which is why they like dogs and get along with dogs. They understand each other, you know. And so they're testing you out. And so they have a temper tantrum in the store and you don't know what to do about it. What you do, your kid has a temper tantrum in the store, you pick up the child, you go outside with them, you stand them up somewhere and just let them have it. Let them have the temper tantrum. It's like, they'll get sick of it soon enough. Go somewhere boring and dull and say, well, have at her, man. Then the kid's done, you say, we're going to stand right here till you decide that you're going to behave. The child knows what that means. It's like, you're going to behave, or we're just going to stand here. It's like, fine, okay, you don't do that. The child has a temper tantrum. It's the third one, you know, and you're embarrassed, you're turning red, everyone's sweating, everyone's looking at you like you're a horrible parent. It's like really unpleasant. You think, oh, I love my child, I like my child. It's like, no, you don't. That's a lie. You go home, the kid's forgotten all about it, you know. They go in their room, they make a little drawing. They're all thrilled, they come out and show it to you, and maybe they did a really good job, you know? Maybe they're even a little guilty about having the damn tantrum. But you, man, you're not happy. And you think, yeah, that's nice. And you go back to whatever useless thing you're doing, and you think, I got that little bastard. Uh -huh. And you think, no, I wouldn't think that. It's like, yeah, wrong. You would. Wrong. Not only would you think it, you would act it out. And if you don't think that that's true, then you don't know yourself very well. And so you gotta think, that little kid is little and powerless. Well, not as powerless as you might think, but <laughs> fundamentally, you got the upper hand, and you've got the proclivity for tyranny deeply rooted in you, and so you better be real careful around that child. I, I used to tell my kids, you know, when I was not in a good mood, say, like, it would be better if you were in your room, mm -hmm. and they didn't mind. They knew what it meant, you know? They were very young. They could understand that. It's like, I, I, you're a fine kid. You know, pat, pat, pat. I'm not in a good mood. Things are likely to be unpleasant. Why don't you just go play in your room for a while? It's like, way they went. They knew how to play in their room, you know, because I didn't want them being around me when I wasn't being going to be a good guy. Yeah. And so, and kids, they, they know they can handle that, man. They can't handle lies. They can handle that sort of truth. No problem. And so, like, I, both my wife and I, we were very careful. It's like, when, when we're starting to not be happy with the kids, with one kid or the other, it was time to have a chat and figure out what it was that had gone off the rails and how we were going to fix it so that we were like thrilled to have that kid around. And that's the thing about kids is you can be thrilled to have them around. Not always. You're tired. You're hungover. Like you've had a bad day. The kid's cranky. Like I'm not saying this is utopia. It's not. That's not the point. But the point is, though, you, you can manage your relationship with your kids and you can have an honest relationship with them and then it will be the best relationship with anybody you've ever had in your life. And I can say that with some certainty because, like, I had a rough time with my daughter because she was very, very, very ill for a long time. It was really bad for mm -hmm. like seven years. It's still touch and go, but it was, she was in excruciating agony for two straight years, mm -hmm. which I can't believe she even did it because, like, three hours of pain that's intense, that's rough. Two years, it's like, maybe you don't get through that, you know? Mm -hmm. But we had a good relationship during, and thank God, if, we, if our family hadn't been well put together by that point, it would have been, it would have taken tragedy and turned it into hell. And so we had a rough time for those years, and still it was good. You know, and that's saying something, because while well, she lost her hip and her ankle during that period, they were both replaced when she was 16, and so she was walking around on two broken legs for two years. It was wow. brutal. But, but our fa like my son, for example, during that period of time, and like hats off to him, he was only 14. You know, when he wanted to be out with all his friends, he stuck around, he supported her. He never complained about it. He never complained about the fact that he didn't get the attention he should have got. He was there like a bloody rock. And my and his sister relied on him a lot, loves him to death, partly because of that. It's like, that was a good thing. And it was because of that foundation yeah. that we had laid, you know, and we, we wouldn't have got through that without yeah. that. It's powerful. I mean, I could even see it in your face, like the, the just a slight change as you talk about it, because it's real. It was it's brutal, real. man. Like one night I went down to talk to her and like the pain had driven her past the edges of her sanity. 
I could see that she was going to crack and we were looking all over the world to find somewhere to get her ankle replaced fast you know because it degenerated very quickly and the, uh, the, the surgeon that we had been talking to wanted to fuse it and we weren't into that we wanted to get a replacement but they're rare and anyways I won't bore you with all the details but yeah it was it was brutal and in, in those situations if your family is fractured it's like you, you don't have the extra energy to deal with the fracturing. You, mm -hmm. you got to have had your ship in order, you know, when you're in stormy seas. It's almost so, like when, you know, it's like when grandma dies and then the family just goes crazy after that or that yeah, type just of thing. Like, that. like it all starts coming out when, exactly. when there's a tragedy. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's how yeah. you see that. That's a great example. You see that a lot at a deathbed. Now, my, my, my wife's mother died of, of essentially of Alzheimer's. It was prefrontal temporal dementia. And she, got it pretty young and degenerated over about 15 years. And her husband, who was a really extroverted party type guy, I have a lot of respect for him, I like him a lot, but uh, he wasn't the sort of stay home and tend to the needy type, you know. But when his wife got sick, man, he took care of her. It was, it was unbelievable. I just cannot believe how good he was at how patient. And her family just pulled together. And on her deathbed too, like her sister's a palliative care nurse, and her, her other sister is a pharmacist. They've had some contact with the rough parts of life, you know. I was at their, her deathbed and like the family was together. And one of the things that was so interesting about that was that they lost their mother and like that's horrible and it's a horrible way to die. But it's so interesting because the bonds between them, the, 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 the sibling bonds and the bonds with the kids and the father were tightened a lot after that. Mm -hmm. And so in some sense, although there was something taken away and it wasn't trivial, and I'm not being a Pollyanna about this. They strengthened their damn family and we spent more time with them and we get along better. And it's like there was a compensation for it. And mm -hmm. so you think, well, what happens if you act nobly through a tragedy? Well, first of all, it's better than the not doing it. Right. But then you also increase the probability that whatever good might come out of it is going to come out of it. So, you know, you can take a tragic situation and tragedy isn't hell. But you can make tragedy into hell, and then it's hell, and no one can stand that. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Two can be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. Uh.